Hello aspirants, welcome back to the series of the Tamil Nadu textbooks. So as already we've promised, we have done with the second part of the Tamil Nadu textbooks, that's 11th standard. And today would be kickstarting with the Vedic culture, which is the standard three, right? So first and foremost, this is purely a connectivity story. If you people have not done with a lesson two, I request you all to first do with a lesson two and only then you'll be able to understand how the lesson three is actually being connected with one another. So history is always about the series to what you have to know. So first, if you have not done, I recommend you all to first go view the lesson two and then come back to the lesson three. So on, on the limelight of this, the thing is that you should know that as we discussed in the last class, there would be something related to Harpan culture. And we also saw the decline to why the Harpan culture had actually been declined. So if you see here, uh, connected to that, the way the culture also started. So the cities of the Harappan culture are actually been declined by 1500 BC. So this was purely where you could also witness that there was a slowdown in the economic and administrative system as well. So this was a time period that the speakers of the Indo-Aryan language, which is called as in Sanskrit, where the people actually entered and the way they actually entered was through the Northwest India. So basically we can tell the Punjab and Rajasthan belt. So the Northwest India from the Indo-Iranian region. So you should know that when they're entering the Northwest India, it should be a place which is located with the Iranian place. So basically the location here stands to be as an Indo-Iranian region. So this was purely that they would have come purely through the passes of the Northwestern mountains. So this is purely, you know, the kind how these people actually entered India is something related to your geography. First and foremost, you need to understand the Harappan culture declined. Secondly, the economic and administrative system also declined. There were the Indo-Aryan language speakers they started entering India and how did they enter? They entered through the Northwest India using the Northwestern mountains and those people, they say that they had been coming from the Indo-Iranian region. And the initial settlement when they entered, the main initial settlement was on to the northwest and the plains of Punjab. Since they came through the northwest India, obviously they have to be settled there. And here, moreover, they later moved on to indo gangetic plains. That is means the Ganga belt, they came deeper. And why do you think these people would have come a little more closer or that started moving from one place to another place because of the pastures. So these people were actually in search of pastures because they were well known cattle keeping people. Since they had the cattle with them, it was a high time that they have to move on for the pastures. So this is again a connected story and that is the reasons from the northwest and the plains of Punjab, they actually moved on to the indo gangetic plains. And if you see your by the 6th century BC, they occupied the whole of North India and the entire North India at that point of time in the 6th century, they used to be called as Aryavarta. So this was a period between like 1500 BC and 600 BC. It was actually being divided into two periods. One is the early Vedic period and the second is called as a later Vedic period. The other name of the early Vedic period can be referred to called as the Rig Vedic period. So understand that. Here, the people who came, who called as an Aryans, they were the people who came from North Iranian, that's the Indo-Iranian region. And they occupied the whole of North India by the 6th century and that place was to be called as Aryavarta. And they divided into two periods, the early Vedic period or the later Vedic period. So that's all about the first. And whichever I've highlighted in the beginning is what you need to know. Apart from that, the others you can just skip it. So as usual, this is the early Vedic and the Rig Vedic we would be doing in detail as of now. So now coming back to what would be the original homes of these Aryans. So here the original home of the Aryans is still a debatable question because they say that there are several views and different scholars are actually spotted and identified different regions of these people actually from where they came from. So some say they are from the Arctic region, some say from they are from Germany, Central Asia, Southern Russia. We should also know that the Balagangadhar Tilak he also made a statement that these peoples were coming from the Arctic region. So he made it on the basis of the astronomical calculations. But however, whatever the most probable or widely accepted by what the historian says that the theory of Southern Russia. So most of them are accepting that the Iran that the Aryans have come from the, the Southern Russias. From there, the Aryans had actually moved for different parts, let's say like Asia and Europe, and then they entered India was about like 1500 BC. 
and one thing again what you have to know is that these people were to be called as Indo-Aryans so they actually spoke the Indo-Aryan language which is called as in Sanskrit so this is a language to what the Aryans actually spoke so coming back to the term called Vedic literature so what is this Vedic literature is all about so the word Veda is actually being derived from the root called Vid so Vid means to know everything so basically in other terms we have to know about like what does Veda actually means it's nothing but a superior knowledge so here the Vedic literature actually consists of four Vedas and you should know what are the four Vedas it is the Rig, Yajur, Sama and Atharva Veda so when we know when we have to talk about what is the Rig Veda so this is of the earliest of all the Vedas and this is purely which is consisting of 1028 hymns wherein these are you know nothing but the praise of various gods were actually they sung wherein the Ajur Veda is purely where it had a details of the rules to be observed at the time of the sacrifices whenever they did the sacrifices there are certain rules to what they have to follow and that was being detailed in the Yajur Veda when it comes to Sama Veda it's nothing but the you know chanting whenever they do the sacrifices there would be a purpose of chanting so that tune is called as in Samaveda to what they would be setting and here they had a lot of books and the origins of the Indian music so if at all we have to know like how did the Indian music or from where did we get the references and we can purely let it to know that it is from the Samaveda so our Indian music is being traced back to Samaveda and the last one is called as an Atharva Veda which actually contains the details of rituals when you're sacrificing something you chant it and that's Samaveda when you sacrifice the time or with suspect to the details of the rules that is Yajur Veda and the details of the rituals itself which has been there and that's called as an Atharva Veda so these are the four uh, kinds of Vedas which is actually one can find it in the Vedic literature that is Rig, Yajur, Sama and Atharva so coming back apart from these Vedas there were also other sacred works for example there were the Brahmanas, Upanishads, Aranyakas and the epics of India that is Ramayana and Mahabharata. So these were the other kinds of sacred works that can be seen back in our Indian culture. So here the Brahmanas were purely read where they had uh, things relating to the prayer and the sacrificial ceremonies to what these people actually made a main point wherein the Upanishads are nothing but a philosophical text. So they purely they dealt with the topic like the soul, the absolute, the origin of the world and mysteries of nature. So the Upanishads, it's all about, uh, you know, thinking behind the human things and they wanted to know how does this actually get into existence. So that is all about the Upanishads. Haranyakas, as the term itself suggests, is nothing but the forest books. So basically they dealt with the rites, rituals, sacrifices and also the mysticisms as well. And the author of the Ramayana, you should know that that is nothing but Valmiki. So this person was the one who had actually written the Ramayana, wherein Mahabharata, it is Vedavyas. So these are the two people but again it depends on to the UPSC preliminary exam to how the questions might be formed but the basic things to what you have to know is these things right. So now by knowing the origin of the Aryans who are Aryans and also the other Vedic literature now it is the time that we move on for the Rig Vedic age which is also called as an early Vedic period. So this one can be dated back to 1500 to 1000 BC. So this is basically where most of the Aryans they were confined to the Indus region and the Rig Veda mostly it, it, you know it is actually referred to be called as in Sapta Sindhu or we call it as Sapta is nothing but seven Sindhu is kinds of reverting so basically they are talking about the land of seven rivers and what are the seven rivers before that the five Pancha rivers you should know that is which are in Punjab which is called as in Jhelum, Jainab, Ravai bees and Satlaj and along with that there are two other rivers which is Indus and Saraswati. You should understand that in the old days it was Saraswati which was a main river out there. So here that is the reason why the Rig Veda would be referred to called as in Sapta Sindhu because the land of seven rivers you should know about the five tributaries of the Indus, Indus and the Saraswati. So this is all about it and moreover the political, social and cultural life of the Rig Vedic people can be traced from the hymns of the Rig Veda. So if you have to know like how was a political, social and cultural life, definitely we can move on for the Rig Veda and that would be giving us a complete understanding to what was the Rig Vedic age was all about. So this stands the basics for the Rig Vedic where it is stating back with 1500 to 1000 BC. 
So now let's start it up with the political organizations to what they are actually formed in the Rig Vedic age. So here the basic unit of the political organization to whatever we have in the modern world, if you have to take this and compare it with the older, that is a Rig Veda, the political organization was called as Kula. Kula is nothing but a family. So there are several families which they actually joined on the basis of the kinship and they formed a village or it is also called as in Grama. The leader of the Grama was known as Gramani. So this was the term to what is being given for a Grama, the kinship of the people like several families joined together and that would be called as Gramani, wherein they had a village which was a group of villages which was constituted. So here we are talking about a village or Grama, the leader is Gramani. Now it is a group of villages. Now all put together, let's say three, four villages together, that which used to be called as a large unit and that used to be referred to as Visu. Wherein the head of this Visu, where a group of villages were been there, they were called as Vishyapati. And the pol highest political unit was called as Jana or is called as a tribe. And moreover, there were several tribal kingdoms during the Rig Vedic period, let's say the Bharatas, the Matsyas, Yadyas and Purus. So these were the main people or the several tribal kingdom which was politically well known in the Rig Vedic period. And moreover, the head of the kingdom was usually be called as in Rajan or it's nothing but the king. So here, what kind of a political system they actually had it in the Rig Vedic period is a monarchical or we can also call it as in succession was through hereditary. So which means that hereditary is through a family tree is what they knew, used to have it, which means that it's a monarchical type. And here, the king was always assisted with one of the person and that is called as Prohita or he is called as a priest wherein the second person is a commander who is called as in Senani. So he was an army in his administration. So two people in the Rig Vedic period were actually assisting the king. One is a Purohita which is called as a priest. Another one is a Senani which is called as a commander. And they had two popular bodies and those bodies are called as Sabha and Samiti. So here Sabha is nothing but the council of the elders wherein the Samiti is nothing but the general assembly of the entire people. So even whatever we have now, let's say the Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha kind, the same thing they had it at that point of time. Sabha, a council of leaders, we can refer it to be as Rajya Sabha, wherein Samiti is nothing but the Lok Sabha which is a general assembly of the entire people out there. So that's how they referred it in the Rig Vedic period. So this was about the political organizations to what the people used to follow in the Rig Vedic period. So coming back to the social life. So social life here is something where the society was patriarchal. So the basic unit of the society was basically family or it's called as in Graham. And here the head of the family basically he used to be called as in Grahapati. So Grahapati is nothing but a family as we know the society unit is Graham. So he is called as in Grahapati. And here the, most of the people they had a practice of monogamy while polygamy was prevalent among the royal and the noble families. So which means that monogamy was generally practiced but we have to talk about polygamy multiple kinds of a marriages that you can see only in the royal and the noble families they, need, they used to have it. And the wife was the one who used to take care of the household and he also, she also participated in all major ceremonies. So this becomes extremely important the position of the women in the Rig Vedic period. So so here they took care of the household first thing and they also participated in the major ceremonies. So women were equal opportunities were being given to them as men for their spiritual and also for their intellectual development. So this is again very important they had a equal opportunities and not it's like now whatever we are seeing or the development what it started over the time. So they were the women who were also called as in women poets like Apala or Viswavara or Gosa, Lopu Mudra, where these were the few, few important women poets who were actually been very great in the Rig Vedic period. So here also the women, they also attended the popular assemblies as well, if something as such. And very, very importantly, there was no child marriage at the practice of Sati. So in the Rig Vedic period, you cannot trace any of the child marriages or a practice of Sati. It was purely absent. So again coming back to the men and women status here both of them they wore an upper and a lower garment so that was purely made of cotton and wool 
by this you can understand that the people in the Rig Vedic period they knew about cotton and they knew about the wool as well and when it comes to the ornaments both men and women they equally wore the variety of the ornaments and the people also knew about the food items like wheat, barley, milk and also the products what they could do out of the milk was curd, ghee even they knew about it they also knew about the vegetables, the fruits and different articles you know kinds of an articles for the foods as well so the people had a wider knowledge compared to the Harappan culture so in the Rig Vedic period they were able to do the byproducts from the main products as well and here eating of the cow's meat was completely prohibited because they had a ritualistic things which was been you know much more earlierly in the Rig Vedic period so they most of the time the Seka they considered it to be as in sacred animal and apart from that the favorite pastimes to what the people in the Rig Vedic they used to do is that they had a chariot race, they had a horse race, dicing, music and dance. These were the most of the important pastimes. So the social division were not very rigid during the Rig Vedic period as over the time it actually was in the later Vedic period. So there was no uh, something where we can call it as a rigidity in the social divisions. So this is about the you know social life of the people of the Rig Vedic. So this you have to know. And when it comes to the economic condition, this is again understanding to what kind of an economy was the people actually been used up there. So in the Rig Vedic Aryans, it was to be called as in pastoral people because here the main occupation as we discussed in the earlier was cattle rearing. So basically any person who has a number of wealth or cattle, let's say if I have 10 cattle, then I am a wealthy person. If another person has just one cattle, then he seems to be a lesser person than me and anyone who has like 100 cattle is more wealthier than me. So basically the wealth of the people were to be estimated in terms of the cattle but now you can say the wealth of the person has been estimated with the house what he lives with the cars and other the bikes whatever he does it. So this is on a civilized country to what we have been seeing now comparatively at that point of time they used to estimate the wealth of the person based on the cattle itself. So when they permanently settled in North India they began to practice the agriculture. So understand here. So in the economic conditions, the people of the Aryans, they started to have something or began the practice called as an agriculture. So with this particular knowledge, they started uh, having a use of iron as well. They started clearing the forest and they started more of lands under the cultivation. And moreover, since they started clearing the forest, they also got a sub important profession that is called as a carpentry. And that was an important profession out there. And they also availability of the wood from the forest, what they cleared, they started making it to be more of profitable. So it starts like this, they knew about the agriculture, they started practicing about it and for that they started clearing the forest and they started more of the lands under cultivation and the trees to whatever they chopped, they started making the carpentry out of it, they started making the things so that they could also see a bit of car, you know, profit on that. And moreover, the carpenters also produced the chariots and the plows as well. So the workers, they used in metal, they made a variety of articles, let's say with the copper, bronze and iron. So again, this is very important. The people, they knew about the copper, bronze and iron at this point of time. Spinning was another important occupation what the people knew because they were uh, having the cotton and wool woolen fabrics were made because they that's how they that is what the ornaments and the cloth what the people men and women they wore it in the Rig Vedic so obviously spinning was there goldsmith also was there because they had a different variety of ornaments this can also be done the potters also there because they had a uh, good various kinds of vessels for the domestic use as well so these were the main important kinds of an uh, you know workmanship we can actually see in the Rig Vedic period so coming back with respect to the trade, trade was very very important economic activity and most of the time the trade used to happen through the rivers itself. So which means that the transportation it was not through hair and land it was mainly through the water that is through the rivers. So here the trade was conducted by the barter system. So basically it is like you give me something and I give you something. There was no prevalent of money but later times they knew about the gold coins and that gold coins were called as Nishka. So this is purely with respect to where they used to have it as a medium of exchange in large transactions. Not only in the large transaction they used to use this which is called as a Nishka. So understand in the Rig Vedic period earlier they had a barter system but over the time they introduced the coin and that's called as a Nishka. So coming back to the religion. So this particular religion is again like understanding how the people were about the religion what knowledge and what was the worship did it so basically we also knew that they also had a lot of sacrifices so obviously religion has been there so here the people actually worship the natural forces like the earth fire wind rain and thunder 
So they actually personified all these natural forces into many gods and also worshipped them. So the most important Rig Vedic gods are actually Prithvi which is called as an earth, Agni, fire, Vayu, wind, Varuna, ran, rain and Indra is thunder. So this is where the most important five gods and among them the most popular was actually Indra that is the thunder god and next importance was uh, Agni that's because this was mainly an intermediary between the gods and the people wherein Varuna was supposed to be as an upholder of the natural order Varuna. So Varuna is nothing but the rain and there also had few of the female gods as well and they were called as Aditi and Ushas. So these were the female gods and there were no temples understand there were no temples and no idol worship during this particular Vedic period. So as we know they were actually focusing on the earth, fire, wind, rain and Indra as basically we can't hold them and make something out of it. So basically there was nothing, there was no temple concept or there was no idol worship concepts. So prayers were pure, I mean offered in the name of the gods which was expectations of the rewards. So they also used the ghee, mill, grain which was purely used for the offerings. So even now you can see that people are using with all these items to be as an offering and now at that point of time that's the time they actually kick started by using the ghee milk and grain as well and elaborated rituals were also followed during this particular worship so this is the basic things to what you have to know when it comes to the rig vedic period so now the second concept as we discussed that it's a period which was actually been divided into two one is the rig vedic another one is the later vedic period so here we'll be seeing that comparatively in the vedic period in the rig that is the early vedic period what were the few important changes which had happened in the later Vedic period? So now moving on to the later Vedic period, the BC which actually accounts is about like 1000 to 600 BC. And we see the Rig Vedic period was between 1500 to 1000 BC when this begins from 1000 BC to dating back to 600 BC. So here the Aryans further, they actually moved towards the east in the later Vedic period. So here for the first time we are understanding that they were confined to the Northwest plain areas and Punjab plains and they later they moved on for the Gangetic plains But in this concept we will be understanding that the Aryans are moving much more deeper that is towards the east and this Satapata Brahmana which is actually refers to the term called expansion of the Aryans to the eastern Gangetic plains which is called as Satapata Brahmana so here uh, we should know about the term what we used there that was the Saptha wherein here it is the Satapatha Brahmana so this is something related to it and we also knew about the seven rivers which has already been listed out there and this is here just an expansion of the Aryans which has been happening so there were also several tribal groups and the kingdoms which was been mentioned in the later Vedic period so one important development during this period was nothing but there were a huge growth of the large kingdoms so here which is called as Kuru and Panchala kingdoms were flourished in the beginning so the two important kingdoms which was being boomed up were Kuru and Panchala and Parikshat and the Janamejaya were the famous rulers of the Kuru kingdom. So these were the two important people wherein the Pravahana Jaiwali was a popular king of the Panchalas. So this is like you can just make a charty kind the large kingdoms too which is Kuru and Panchala and it was being biggest and the people who ruled the Kuru kingdom was Parikshat and the Janamejaya wherein when it comes to Panchala it is the Pravahana Jaiveli. So he was all they were also being known to pattern of learning a lot. So after the fall of these Kurus and Panchalas, the other kingdoms came, and mostly those kingdoms were Kosala, Kasi, Vedeha, which came into be the most prominent one. So when it comes to a famous ruler of the Kasi, you should know it is Mr. Ajata Shatru. So when it comes to Janaka was a king of Vedaha, which is a which was to be called as a capital of Mithila. So this court was being adorned by the scholar Yajna Valkya and moreover Magadha, Anga, Wanga they actually seem to be an easternmost tribal kingdoms. So the later Vedic text also refer to three divisions that is the Aryavartha the northern India, Madhya Dehesa central India, Dakshinapata the southern India. So the basically the later Vedic period actually referred the three divisions of India and these were the three division Aryavartha, Madhya Desa and Dakshinapata. So this is that. So what I recommend you all to do from the larger kingdoms is that just make a chart, draw northwest east and how you wanted to do it and see and start putting up with what are the kingdoms and who actually ruled which place. So that would be more than sufficient and don't try to take this as a para itself. Just try to recreate in terms of a map so that it will be much easier for you all. 
so this is about it and coming back to the political organization as we already discussed in the rig vedic period so the larger kingdoms as we knew that they were formed during the later vedic period many jana or the tribes were actually being amalgamated so it was like bigger one right now so they formed to be called as in janapadas or rashtras so these were the two important terms which actually emerged which is the janapadas and which is called as in rashtras because most of the jana and the tribes were amalgamated here so the royal power had actually increased along with the increase in the size of the kingdom as well so here the king actually performed various rituals and also the sacrifices where he wanted to strengthen his position even if you see in ramayana mahabharata and all you could see that the most of the time the king used to do a lot of you know uh, uh, sacrifices and other things which all which means that basically he wants to have that royal power to increase the size of the kingdom for that he actually did a lot of positions to hold it and one base thing is about the consecration ceremony which is called as a rajasuya or we call it as aswamedha the most famous one that's our sacrifice wherein the third one would be called as in vachpeya which is a chariot race so these were the most important uh, kinds of rituals and sacrifices what they used to do to strengthen their position so the kings also assumed the titles called raja viswajanan or it's called as haila bhuvana pathi that is basically a lord of the earth ekrat and samrat the sole rulers so these were the other titles to what you can actually see in the political organization which we didn't find it in the rig vedic period so moreover in the later vedic period a large number of new officials were also been seen so this was uh, in addition to the purohita senani and gramani so these were the three important terms to what we saw there but these included also few important you know officials they were the treasury officer tax collector and the royal messengers as well so at the lower levels the administration was purely carried on by the village assemblies itself so they did not had much of it the village assemblies they used to take care and the importance of the samiti and the sabha had actually diminished during the vedolithic period so understand that the samiti and sabha were purely for the rigvedic period by the time we moved on for the later veda later vedic period i'm sorry about it so they actually diminished the two important assemblies that is the samiti and sabha so this is about it and then comes with respect to the economic condition so when it comes to economic condition here the iron was used extensively in this particular period so the people were uh, having a proper knowledge about how the iron could be used because we also knew that in the rig vedic period also they used the iron and again you should know that why was it being used because they wanted to clear the forest and they brought more of the land under the cultivation because the agriculture was a main occupation for the people out there so here more of the improved implements where types of implements were actually been used in the cultivation and besides barley rice wheat the people also knew to know do a manuring for so the manure also the knowledge of manure was another important improvement under the later vedic period so industrial activity also became more varied and there were a great specialization as well there were a lot of metal work leather work carpentry or pottery which was made for a great progress and people also in addition they started knowing about the internal trade or about the foreign trade which also became extensive in the large later vedic period so we also knew that they had the coming of transport through the rig vedic period through the rivers but here they are coming across a term called as in foreign trade so the later vedic people were familiar in the sea and they traded with the countries called babylonia so this was more of the evidences but these kinds of evidences we didn't find it in the rig vedic period and here the class of the hereditary merchants which is called as in vaniya came into existence as well so this is basically a merchant class and the vaisyas also carried on the trade and the commerce and they organized themselves into the guilds which is actually called as ghanas and besides nishka you should know that we spoke about the gold coins which is of the rig vedic period but here the people also knew about the gold and silver and this time it was called as in sathamana or the krishnala where they actually used as a medium of exchange so this was been used under the later vedic period so coming back to the social life so how was the social life of the later vedic period so here the four divisions of the society was seen that is Brahm, brahmins kshatriyas vaishyas and sudras so these were called as in varna system so this was purely established during the 
later Vedic period. So there we begin with the Vedic literature as we saw the Vedas but the Varna system actually started in the later Vedic period. So this might become as one of your preliminary question as well. The two higher classes which is basically referred to as Brahmana and Kshatriya. They enjoyed all of the privileges to whatever they have to get but the other two classes that is the Vaishyas and Sutras they were not being given with these privileges and they were being purely denied. So here the Brahmin he actually occupied a higher position than the Kshatriya. So basically they occupied a higher but sometimes they also claim that the Kshatriya claimed a higher status than the Brahmins. But there were also many sub caste and the other kinds of basis of the occupation appeared in this particular period. To whatever the issues have been happening now you can trace it back to the later Vedic period where the uh, you know the Varna system actually started on. So in the family the power of the father actually increased during the later Vedic period. So there was no improvement in the status of the women. You should know that in the Rig Vedic period they were equally being treated but here you could see that the father position was being increased out here and moreover they started having a kind of a mindset where inferiority and subordinate to the men. So that was the status of the women and since it was no improvement and just one gender had increased more the women also lost their political rights of attending the assemblies. So comparatively to the Rig Vedic period the people the women started moving on to the assembly she started attending it but here it is totally been lost it out here and we also knew that there was no child marriage or sati system in the Rig Vedic period but here actually the child marriages were more of commonness it became more common and according to the I'm sorry Atreya Brahmana or it is called which is her daughter has been described as source of a misery so there is one of the texts which is called as an Atreya Brahmana so according to that the term or the child called daughter was described as source of misery. So most of the women in the royal household enjoyed certain privileges. Most, most of the women who have been born to the you know uh, lower status of the people they were purely called to be as misery. And next is uh, the religion. So in the religion the gods of the early Vedic period like Indra and Hagni totally the lost their importance. So because there were few other gods which is the Prajapati the creator, Vishnu, the protector, Rudra, the destroyer. They became more prominent during the later Vedic period. So understand Indra and Agni and other gods were more prominently seen in the you know, uh, Rig Vedic period wherein the uh, um, later Vedic period it was the Prajapati, the creator, Vishnu and Rudra. So moreover the sacrifices were still important and the rituals were connected as more as what it was and it was more elaborate in the later Vedic period and moreover the prayers actually declined and the sacrifice increased. The prayers whatever they actually used to do it, it declined but the sacrifices increased. The priesthood became the main profession and most of the people started following it as an hereditary. So the formulae for sacrifices were invented and elaborated by the priestly classes. So therefore towards the end of this period there was a strong reaction against a priestly domination and moreover it was against the sacrifices and also the rituals. So at this point of time there was an important kinds of an elaborate sacrifices which can be seen and referred to which is called as Buddhism and Jainism. So all the authors of the Upanishads which were uh, purely an essence of an Hindu philosophy they actually turned away from the useless rituals and they insisted on a true knowledge that takes jnana for peace and salvation. So this was about the basics there uh, by the end of the later Vedic period there was a rise of Buddhism and Jainism which we can actually get connected with. So this was purely on to the uh, Vedic period. So Vedic culture is being done by now. So these were the important things and uh, this is about like what is the outcome of the learning. So uh, that's about it. So by this we have done with the third lesson that is called as in Vedic culture. It is very important again I am saying y'all whoever is being done with your other books and you have been referring to the other sources please do continue them. You don't have to get confused with the videos which has been uploaded like this. This is only for the people who are really not having an idea. We are trying to extend our services for them. So if you are not started anything go through with that. If you are a strong person you are not going to get confused. If it is really going to help the others also can look onto this video. But just ensure that this would not become a pressure point for you all. So just try to avoid all the other things which is actually becoming a pressure point. Even if my videos is actually giving a pressure when you are already done the other source please don't watch them absolutely no problem about it but be very sure to what you have to prepare and be very limited to your sources 
and when it comes to Vedic culture, since they have been divided into two, the Rig Vedic and the later Vedic period, I request you all to make this as a you know kind of a box kind. Just make it as a comparison between the Rig Vedic and the later Vedic. So whenever you read, the things becomes much more easier. And what you can do is the entire Vedic culture try to get it to just one page. Don't get it more as we know that this has been. Uh, we have to do a lot more again. So try to keep the content very limited. So the entire 11th standard textbook by the end of this video, you should be able to complete it by just one hour. So that's how you need to make your notes. So this is purely on that. So by this we have come. So in the next video, we'll be continuing with our next lesson from the 11th standard textbook. Thank you and have a nice day.